Huh? A phone call? As the ringtone of my smartphone sounded, I looked at the screen, and so it was from my dad. Hello? Dad, what's up? Emily, have you already reached John's family home? Not yet. But, I just got off the train and missed the bus. Looks like I have to wait about 30 minutes for the next one. Oh, that's good. What time is the next train heading back? Heading back? Ah, uh, in about 20 minutes. Okay, got it. Then wait in the station lounge. Uh? Don't get on the bus. Just wait there until I come to pick you up. That's impossible. I need to go help with the wake at Susan's place as soon as possible. You don't need to go. Why not? John is on a business trip in Italy. I have to go since I'm the only one here. I'll explain everything once we meet up. Just don't go, alright. Ah, uh, okay. I'll wait then. Why is Dad so frantic about calling me when I'm on my way to my deceased Mill's house? Despite my doubts, I decided to wait for my dad. My name is Emily Johnson. I've been married to John for three years. Currently, I work part-time at a bookstore close to the nearest station. My husband, John, works in the system development department of a multinational corporation. His company, expanding both domestically and internationally, focuses on developing and building ID systems, so he often travels abroad for half of the month. John's family home is in a rural area, and they continued farming until his father passed away. The first time I visited with John, you know, since I'm alone, my cooking becomes pretty casual. All I eat is rice and pickles. His mom, Susan, while laughing, served me rice and her homemade pickled cabbage. The delicious rice and superb pickles were a real treat. Susan, this is delicious. I can't think of any other words but delicious. I'd eat it every day. She seemed pleased to hear that. Feel free to have seconds. When leaving, she gave me pickles, ordered tea from Oregon, and rice from Idaho. It feels like it just happened yesterday. On the first day I met her, I felt we would build a good relationship. It takes about two hours by car to reach John's family home. It also takes about two and a half hours by train and bus. This morning, I got a call from my cell, Sarah, about Susan's death. Hello, Emily. Susan passed away a little while ago. The wake is tonight. Can you make it by 2 p.m.? Yes, I understand. But John is currently overseas on a business trip. I'll try to contact him but I'm not sure if he can return today or tomorrow. Oh, is that so? That's fine. Just you come. Really? Sarah seemed oddly happy about it. Can you give me this specific time and location when you are ready? I want to contact my parents. Of course, though, and don't forget to bring a black apron. Sure, I won't forget. Thanks. I'll be in touch later. After hanging up, I checked the time on my phone. It was 9 a.m. There's a six hour time difference with Italy. So it's 3 a.m. there. Is John asleep? But this can't be helped. I tried calling, but it went to voicemail after seven rings. Susan passed away. The wake is tonight, US time and the funeral seems to be tomorrow. Can you make it back? I left a message on the voicemail, so now it's just waiting for a response. After that, I called my boss at the bookstore where I work to request some day off. Um, I need to call my mom next. Hello, mom? Oh, Emily, 
Are you off from the bookstore today? Yeah, I took the day off. You see, this morning, I got a call that Susan passed away. What? She was still young. What happened? I just found out myself and don't know the details, but I'm getting ready to head there now. That's so hard to believe. I'll let your dad know. I only know that the wake is tonight. I'll call you back as soon as I have the time and place. All right. John might not make it in time for tonight, so take care. Okay, talk to you later. Now, I need to get my stiffs together. As I opened my closet, a black handbag in front of my morning clothes jumped into my eyes. This. This black handbag was given to me by John's mom when she visited our house two months ago. It's good to have one nice item like this. You can use it for a long time. She had said while handing me the bag, still in its box. Susan was always a gentle and calm speaker, and she taught me the bare minimum about the customs and relations of their old family, as I was not very familiar with them. John and Emily, you're living in the city, so don't worry about country relationships. You have your own way of life in the city, right? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. She said with a smile. When John and I had been married for about half a year, we attended a relative's wedding in the city and ended up staying at his family home for a night. Since we rarely got the chance, we went shopping together in the shopping district and then went to a karaoke box where John's mom made her karaoke debut. She was so happy about it, smiling all the time. Emily, in the 42 years since I married into the Johnson family, I've never had this much fun. Thank you. Susan, really? I'm always happy to hang out, so come visit anytime. Really? That makes me so happy. Maybe I'll come over again. Absolutely. By the time we got married, John's father had already passed away, and John left home for college, while his brother moved out, when he got a job. Until John's father passed away three years ago, Susan had hardly ever left their rural town. I used to help with the fields and go to the rice paddies and check on our rental apartments and houses. The year would just fly by. So, after Dad passed away, I decided to stop farming and take it easy for a while. She used to say in her usual calm and cheerful manner. Come to think of it, I've never seen Susan get angry. She was kind to everyone and never imposed her opinions on others. I want to be a grandma like her someday. I thought vaguely. I packed clothes for a few days and my morning attire into a suitcase and reached for the formal bag that Susan had given me. As I grabbed the handle and placed the bag on my lap, my sight seemed to blur. Uh. Although I hadn't shed any tears when I heard the news of her death, now they were streaming down my face. I must have been holding back my emotions. Willing not to upset Susan. Ugh. As precious memories with Susan flooded my mind, I hugged a bag and cried out loud. I never imagined saying goodbye so soon. We were supposed to go shopping and to karaoke next month. And she had promised to come stay with us for a while when the baby was born. When I found out I was pregnant last month, she was the happiest and congratulated me. Every time I picked up something that reminded me of Susan, all the memories from these past three years came rushing back. No, no, I can't get caught up in memories now. 
I need to get ready. I can't keep Sarah and the others waiting. I glanced at the clock. It was already 10.30 am. I need to hurry. As I stepped out of the house, I received a call from Sarah. Emily, have you been able to reach John? No, I'm sorry. There's an six hour time difference. So it's the early morning there. I couldn't get through. Oh, I see. Well, that can't be helped. The wake is tonight at 7 p.m. and the funeral is tomorrow at 11 a.m. Oh, all right. So, tonight at 7 p.m. and tomorrow at 11 a.m. This service will be held at the church we always go to, so please tell your parents that, Emily. Okay, got it. Truth be told, I was not very comfortable with my sill, Sarah and Erica. John, being the youngest of three siblings, is six years younger than his older brother, Mike, and three years younger than his older sister, Erica. Mike is quiet and reserved, and John is somewhat similar. Erica, the eldest, is the type who says whatever is on her mind. During gatherings like Thanksgiving or New Year's, Erica would always start with, Emily, still no baby, and Sarah would inevitably join in. You really should have your first child before you turn 30. Ah, uh, yes. After a year of marriage. Really? Still no news? Could you possibly be a sexless couple? Maybe John has someone else on the side. Wouldn't be surprising, right? They would take turns throwing these snide remarks. During such times, Susan wouldn't raise her voice, but would gently admonish them. Sarah, Erica, you're both parents, aren't you? You know it's not nice to say things that can hurt others. Since everyone comes here together, I want them to always have a good time. Although I didn't interact much with Sarah and Erica normally, Susan and I actually saw each other almost every month. If we went visit her this month, she visited us following month. Mom and Emily don't seem like a mill and deal. Is that so? Yay. It's more like a mother and daughter. John often said that. Those were good times. Thinking this, 20 minutes passed as I waited at the station. My dad's taxi pulled up in front of me. Gennon, we need to talk about something important. He said with a stern expression. What could he possibly need to talk about so urgently? What happened? Why did you suddenly say not to go? Well, actually, I received a letter from Susan yesterday. A letter from Susan to you, Dad? Yeah, she wrote that she absolutely didn't want Emily to go to the Johnson house alone. What does that mean? You should read it yourself. Oh, okay. After reading it, you'll understand why I stopped you. What do you mean? He handed me a white envelope, and I was shocked by its contents. Dear sir, thank you for the delicious sweets you sent the other day. I am writing this letter to make a rather forward request, and I hope you will forgive me for using this method. The request is that, should I pass away, Please ensure that Emily never comes to our house alone. As you know, John often travels abroad and may not be able to return immediately upon my passing. Could you please make sure that she attends the funeral only with John? I am embarrassed to say this, but if the funeral is rushed before John returns, Mike and his wife, along with Erica, might try to get Emily to sign a property renunciation document. 
Without John's consent, the renunciation process shouldn't be happened. I am sorry for involving Emily in any inheritance dispute. I have left my will to a trusted friend regarding the property division. I apologize for making such a request through a letter. I pray for the health and happiness of you and your wife, sincerely. Just as I finished reading, my phone rang. It's Chan. Hello. Emily. I listen to your voicemail. Yeah. My sisters. They're trying to finish the funeral before I get back, aren't they? It seems so, probably. Emily, you don't need to go today. Huh? I'll talk to Erica and Mike and ask them to reschedule. Okay, that sounds good. I can be back by tomorrow evening on the earliest flight. It's better if we both attend together. That's right. So just wait at home for me. Okay. See you tomorrow. I felt relieved knowing John would be coming back. Is John really able to get back tomorrow? Yeah, it seems so. Actually, this morning, by chance, I ended up driving Sarah and the others in this taxi. They didn't seem to realize it was me. Mike was trying to persuade them to postpone the funeral by a day. They were planning to get you to agree to property renunciation while John was still away. What? Really? Just like Susan suspected. Seems so. Apparently, Sarah's son recently crashed her car and they're facing a lawsuit for several hundred thousand dollars. Wait, Sarah's car is a German luxury model, right? It should have insurance. It was insured, but only for Sarah. Her son forgot to get a one-day insurance. With the car all banged up, she was furious about having to replace it. So they were trying to get as much of the inheritance as they could. The next evening, John safely returned home. We were all able to attend Susan's funeral together, and the will revealed an equal division of $300,000 to each couple. Sarah looked uncomfortable. Mike, will the payment for the accident cover everything? Thanks for worrying, Emily. We're still short about $100,000, but we'll manage. Not changing the insurance policy was our fault as parents. If it's okay, you can use $100,000 for my share. As soon as I said this, Everyone turned to look at me. Sarah quickly responded. Really? Thank you. But then, her son, Michael, stepped forward and bowed. I can't accept that. Michael, Emily is kindly offering. No, Mom. It's my responsibility for causing the accident. How about I lend the money to Michael? and he can pay me back a little each month. When I suggested this, Michael gratefully accepted. If Emily is okay with that, I'd like to borrow it. I'm sorry. He promised to pay back $500 a month from his part-time job earnings. This seemed like something Susan would approve of. Emily, you're too kind-hearted. I almost felt like I could hear Susan's voice. Since then, Michael has been faithfully paying back the money each month. Sarah, warned by her son, stopped meddling in the matter. Time passed, and finally, the day came for me to give birth. John sent me off to the delivery room with a smile. If Susan were still here, she would have been with me, encouraging me. Thinking this, I entered the room. It took some time since it was my first childbirth, but a healthy baby girl was born. Congratulations, said the nurse as I smiled at my crying baby. 
After a few days in the hospital, it was time to go home. John had been given some time off from work so we could cherish our time as a family. Soon, we'll visit Susan's grave with our daughter. I smiled, imagining Susan's joyful face at seeing the baby. I decided to marry you because I thought you were a wealthy president's daughter, even though you're plain. But I don't need a woman who makes only $6 an hour. Dumb wife, get out of the house. I'm sick of being mothered by someone like you. I don't need a low-income old lady. Please leave. They smirked at me while saying such things. As if leaving no room for argument, my belongings had already been packed into cardboard boxes and trash bags placed beside them. I had a lot to say, but my heart was too shredded to talk back. So, you want to divorce me and have me leave this house, right? That's right. I'm glad you're understanding. Once you're gone, Dad can finally be happy. Fine, but you too will regret this. I wasn't so nice as to stay silent after being told all this. They will surely regret my leaving this house. My name is Susan Johns. I'm a 50-year-old office worker. I've been working at my father's company while raising my daughter, Lily, alone and managing household chores for over a decade. I married Bill, my husband, 10 years ago. Our meeting was through work. Bill was a sales representative for a client, and I always found him easy to talk to. He wasn't my type looks wise, but I, not great at making friends, was secretly drawn to the bright and always smiling Bill. During that time, Bill confessed and we started dating. At first, I was intimidated by the thought that we weren't a match, but he said, your shy nature and domesticity are charming. Our relationship was smooth and enjoyable. But one day, Bill dropped a bombshell. Actually, I have a daughter, who's 10, this confession came six months into our relationship, right when Bill proposed. What? The news that Bill had a child was completely unexpected. I knew he was divorced before we dated, but I never imagined he had a child. I was thrilled about the proposal, but honestly, I was more bewildered but Bill would take me to nice restaurants and places with beautiful night views. He always had something positive to say to me, the pessimist. Life with him would surely be fun. I fought and I started wanting to marry him. Stay away from a divorced man with a child. It's bound to make you suffer. I face strong opposition from my strict father. Still, Bill promised, I will definitely make you happy. Believing that I could overcome any difficulty with Bill, we got married despite my parents' opposition. But I wish I could tell my past self that you should listen to what your parents said. Otherwise, you'll end up seeing hell. As we were getting married, I worried about whether I could get along with Bill's daughter, Lily, and whether I, who had never raised a child, could truly become a mother. The first day I met Lily. Nice to meet you, I'm Susan. Nice to meet you, I'm Lily. Come in quickly. She greeted me with a smile grabbed my arm, and led me to the living room. You're a daughter of president, right? Wow, that's impressive. So cool. 
Her eyes sparkled with innocence, and it touched my heart. I could tell she was a really good kid. That day, I cooked a homemade meal. I went all out, preparing lots of dishes that kids would like. Lily stuffed her mouth with food and kept saying, delicious, over and over. I remember being so happy. Susan's cooking is amazing. It's nothing like Dad's. To eat this every day would be the best. She seemed to have accepted her father's remarriage surprisingly easily. What are you talking about, Lily? Dad's cooking is good too, right? Well, it's always the same dishes, and they're bland. Susan's cooking is way better. Now, I'm going to cry. You're making me sad. They joked and teased each other like that. I could see they were a close-knit family. Also, let's talk about our family finances. My husband is just an average employee at a small to medium-sized company. While I am a president's daughter, I've worked long at my father's company, holding a position and earning a decent income. So, our family's finances largely depended on my salary. There was an understanding that my husband would actively take on household and parenting duties, so I never really had any complaints, whoever can earn should do so, which was our family's approach. That's why I started by replacing my single-use furniture and appliances with family-friendly ones to make life easier for Lily and Bill, aiming to quickly become a full-fledged family member. The same went for our living situation. During my single days, I lived in an apartment owned by my father's company. It was too large for just me, so they decided to move into my apartment. And that's how the new life for the three of us, me, Will, and Lily, began. When Lily first visited my apartment, she ran around, excitedly shouting, It's so spacious, amazing. Seeing her like that, I vowed to do my best in parenting and work, hoping she would grow up to be a fine adult. Life with the three of us was stress-free, peaceful, and fun. Blood relation didn't matter. We three were a real family, looking forward to life ahead. However, reality was not so sweet. As Lily entered middle school, her attitude towards me began to change. She joined the badminton club in middle school. It was a club, passionate about practice, so she was at school during the day and at club activities from evening to night, gradually spending less time at home. On days off from club activities, she would come home from school, throw her bag on the sofa, and just play with her phone. That's when the distance between Lily and me began to grow. Even when I tried to talk to her, she wouldn't even nod, let alone face me. When I discussed Lily's attitude with my husband, he said, It's just her being rebellious because she's in middle school, don't worry about it, and I thought it would settle down after a while. But no matter how long I waited, her attitude didn't change. I continued to try engaging with Lily, but the response was lackluster, and sometimes she would sigh deeply and say, what, don't talk to me, completely rejecting me. Even when watching TV together in the living room, Lily would only talk to Bill. It was as if she didn't hear anything I said. Yet. When she needed something, like, hey, I need this for club activities tomorrow, can you wash it? She would talk to me. At other times, 
I was like heir to her. Still, I tried to meet Lily's demands, not wanting our relationship to drift further apart. However, I also worked at a job that didn't just require weekends off. I was on a shift schedule and often swamped with work, even on my days off. My job was demanding, sometimes requiring me to telework, even on holidays. I don't dislike my job, and I'm thankful that I can work, but the busier work got, the more inevitable it was that I couldn't always meet Lily's demands. When I was trying to cook dinner, after work, she would ask me to buy a cake in front of the station, or to make a different dish, saying, I don't like this side dish, make hamburgers instead. Every time I said no, Lily would make a displeased face, clicking her tongue and saying, useless, do it if you're a mother, before storming off to her room. Lately, my daughter often says, a mother would do this, right? I've said it many times, but on the family register, I'm Lily's mother, although Lily and I are not blood related. I have always tried to earn Lily's acceptance, but I still feel she doesn't recognize me as her mother. Every time Lily says that, I blame myself for not being able to meet her demands and fall into self-loathing. The same goes for my relationship with my husband. Bill was very kind and full of smiles when we first met, trying to get my attention. However, it seems he's the type who doesn't feed the fish one scart as his attitude towards me cooled off after a year of marriage. We no longer felt like a close couple, but more like mere cohabitants. So, I tried to get his attention by suggesting, how about we go on a date, just the two of us, but he rejected it, saying, a date, we have a daughter, Lily. It's weird to talk about dating. What would Lily think? I wanted to remind him that we dated, even though he had a child when we met. But saying that would only make him angry again. What troubled me most was the reckless spending of Bill and Lily. I earn a good salary from my father's company, holding a position there. Yet, due to their spending, we hardly save any money. I've repeatedly pointed this out to both of them, but they never tried to improve. Not only that. You're so stingy. She's such a terrible woman. They even started saying that. I'm not having a happy marriage life. However, I tried to convince myself that perhaps this is just what marriage is like, as I married for the first time after turning 40. Time flew by, and before I knew it, I turned 50. Lily has turned 21, and today, we are throwing a celebration party for her. Turning 21 signifies reaching adulthood, a milestone that represents stepping into a new stage as an adult. In our area, we celebrate it in a big way too. It should be a joyous occasion to celebrate my important daughter's 21st birthday. However, I couldn't feel genuinely happy. I remembered the day we first met when I fought I'll do my best in parenting so she can grow into a respectable adult. On the day of the celebration, I took the day off work, prepared the dress as my daughter had requested, and also made an appointment at the beauty salon. I was fully prepared for the celebration, getting up early in the morning to drive my daughter. After getting dressed and ready, 
seeing Lily's glamorous appearance made me naturally break into a smile. You look truly beautiful. You've become a lovely woman. My husband exclaimed, Wow, Lily, you look great. Truly my daughter, the most beautiful one. Lily smiled only at her father, saying, Thanks, Dad. However, she completely ignored my words. My husband was dressed in a suit, getting ready to head to the party venue. I had also put on nicer clothes than usual, intending to go to the celebration party with Lily and my husband. But then, what? Why is the old lady trying to come? You absolutely must not come to the ceremony. She sharply told me. My daughter, calling me old lady and hurling insults. Wait, but I wanted to go, since my daughter is dressed so beautifully. Even though I tried to keep smiling despite the harsh words, it seemed to have the opposite effect. So annoying, you're a fake mother. Stop pretending to be my mom. Don't call me your daughter. Just don't come, okay? I don't want my friend to think my mom is such a plain woman. She shooed me away with her hands. I wondered if this behavior was truly that of a respectable adult. A fake mother, ha. Huh? I wondered if I had gone wrong somewhere in raising her. Duh. I let out a big sigh. They ended up going without me. Left with no choice, I decided to spend my time leisurely at home. But with my schedule suddenly cleared and nothing to do, I decided to head to the office and work. It was a stark realization of how much of a workaholic I am. After finishing work reasonably early, I returned home to find my husband sitting on the sofa, frowning and with his arms crossed. His unusual demeanor gave me a sense of unease. What's wrong? Why didn't you tell me? Tell you, about what? Your father's company is on the verge of bankruptcy. They've significantly downsized their business in America, hadn't they? It seems my father's company no longer does business with my husband's company, so he wasn't aware of the details, but he apparently picked up on these rumors from somewhere. Bankruptcy crisis, that doesn't sound quite right but I am aware of the downsizing in America. I wanted to discuss it, so I was planning to talk after the celebration party. What? You were just planning to talk about it. What about the salary? What's going to happen with it? It seemed he only worried about my salary. The salary might decrease until things settle down, I guess. What? You're joking. Lily is still going to college, right? How are we going to handle the tuition? We have the tuition covered. Besides, I tried to explain the situation with my father's company and why the salary might decrease, but my husband wouldn't listen at all. Enough. You can turn money, and you can't even get along with your own daughter. You really are a failure as a mother. His words, a failure as a mother, pierced my heart. It's true that my salary had decreased, and I couldn't even pretend to have a good relationship with my daughter. Being so bluntly denied, my place shook me. I need to rethink our future together. Saying so, he slammed the door loudly as he left the house. I also wanted to rethink our future. I had intended to have a proper discussion after Lily's celebration was over. Why does nothing ever go right? The next day was busier than usual at work, 
so I decided to stay late before heading home. Bill used to say that the one who earns more should work and the other should cook if they get home early, but that promise had long been broken. Assuming there would be no dinner prepared at home again today, I decided to buy ready-made meals to get by. When I arrived home, I found Bill and Lily smirking about something. Usually, they would just watch TV or stay in their rooms when I got back, so their behavior was noticeably odd. Their reaction was as if they had been waiting for me to return. But it didn't seem welcoming. I had a bad feeling about this. My bad premonitions like this always tend to come true. And today was no exception. You're finally back. Took you long enough. Really? You're so late. We got tired of waiting. Ah, uh, well, I've been a bit busier recently with new tasks at work. But what's going on, both of you? Here, take this. He threw a large package at me. Open it and see. Is this? When I opened the bag, of course, there was no present inside. I found it filled with my clothes and cosmetics. What in the world? I couldn't understand, my farts failing to catch up. Then my daughter said, come this way, and led me to a room at the back of a living room. Opening the door, I saw many of my belongings packed into cardboard boxes and trash bags. Geez, mom, you have too much stuff. It was tough to pack everything up, you know. I even took time off work to do this. Really tired me out. That's funny. Poor dad. Watching them laugh together, I finally understood their intention. You want me to leave? That's right. Lily and I have been discussing this for a while. Yeah, Mom, your father's company is in serious trouble, right? And your salary has decreased, hasn't it? No use hiding it. I heard everything from Dad. No, that's... Really? Your role in this house is over. That's right. We don't need someone who can turn money anymore. Without giving me a chance to speak, it seemed they were both intent on blaming me. They spoke so rapidly that I couldn't find a moment to interject and just listened with my head down. As I remained silent, they seemed to forget my presence and their true feelings spilled out. I married you because I thought you were a daughter of president, only to find out it was a complete misfortune. Exactly. I thought I could live in a fancy apartment and be a rich kid, accepting a plain-faced mom like you, only to be scolded for spending too much. With this face, I can't even tell my friends you're my mom. What are you both saying? I managed to interject with a feeble voice. But this only fueled their momentum. I can say it now. I married you for help with child care and money. What? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My ex-wife was terrible at parenting. She couldn't turn or handle child care, went into postpartum depression, and that's why my first marriage failed. I took custody of Lily because she mattered to me, but as a mere employee at a small company, I thought I couldn't raise her alone, so I looked for someone plain, who seemed to have some money, and wouldn't betray me. Then it turned out there was someone, who fit the bill perfectly, and that someone was you. You're kidding, I married you against my parents' wishes. You're such an idiot. You'd blush at any compliment. It was so easy to win you over. And I even married you. 
That's cruel. Who's cruel here? A failing company is just too much. I saw your recent pay slips. You're making like $6 an hour. It's the worst. Now that Lily is all grown up, we don't need a low-income, dumb wife. Get out of the house. My wage is $6 an hour. What are they even talking about? I couldn't make sense of any of it. As I silently pondered, my daughter continued, echoing my husband's sentiments. I'm so tired of having a mother like you. We don't need a low-income old lady. Please leave. Their cruel words shattered my heart. They've been feeling that way. I never realized that. I wanted to say so much, but I no longer had the energy. So, you want to divorce me and have me leave this house, right? That's right. I'm glad you're understanding. Poor dad, hurt and deceived by this woman. Finally, you can be happy. I wondered why my daughter hated me so much. I don't recall doing anything to deserve such harsh words from either my husband or my daughter. My daughter seemed to despise me intensely, glaring at me with a demonic expression. Seeing her like this, my husband smirked with satisfaction. I felt anger boiling up inside me at the sight of my husband's smug expression. I'm not so kind-hearted as to stay silent after being treated this way. Surely, they will regret it when I leave this house. I began preparing to leave, immediately. Oh, so you're really going to leave. It looks like you finally realized you're a burden in this house. It took long enough. My husband sarcastically moved my belongings to the entrance. Seeing my husband moving the bags, my daughter oddly sympathized with him, saying, Dad is such a good-hearted person to help move the luggage. We'll send the remaining items by cash on delivery later. But if you don't move your stuff out within a week, we'll dispose of everything, just so you know. He suddenly told me to leave, set a deadline for moving out my belongings, and then he's now threatening to dispose of them if I don't meet the deadline. How incredibly selfish. Fine, but let me say this, you will definitely regret it. Be prepared. I said to my husband in the loudest voice I've ever used in my life. Regret? No way. He laughed, but I ignored him and left the house. That day, I decided to stay in the company-owned apartment. I planned to live there until I found a new place. Though I could have had my belongings sent, I didn't want my address known, so I waited for a chance when my husband and daughter were away to hire movers myself. As we both worked, our savings were split equally between us. My husband, with his spending habits, had no savings. As a result, a significant portion of the money I had saved ended up going to him, but that was the rule, so I had to comply. In the end, I handed over about $100,000. Well, I hope they use that money for my daughter's college expenses. That was the plan, anyway. And so, our divorce was finalized. My heart was torn until the divorce, but surprisingly, I felt more at ease and happier after it was done. My feelings were unexpectedly clear. It just shows how distorted my married life had been. Two months after the divorce was finalized, I received a call from my ex-husband. I hesitated to answer, 
Suspecting what it might be about, but curious about his predicament, I decided to listen for amusement. Hey, what the hell is this about? My ex-husband sounded quite panicked from the get-go. What's wrong? I had a pretty good idea what the issue was, but I asked anyway. I've been told to leave this house by tomorrow. Why? It's our apartment, isn't it? Of course, it's my company-owned apartment. It's clear that two strangers divorced from each other shouldn't be able to live together. It's quite obvious. But, even if you say that suddenly, I have no idea where to go next. Can you ask your father to let Lily and me continue living here? What are you talking about? I was suddenly kicked out by you, two months ago, with no place to go. Fo is completely unconcerned about that. About that. I'm sorry. So, can you help us out? No matter what you say, it's impossible. Is that all you wanted to say? I'm hanging up. Such a cheap apology surely won't make me forgive what happened that day. Even after our divorce, it seems this man still underestimates me to no end. As I was about to hang up, my ex-husband said, Wait, wait, don't hang up. What now? Is there something else? There's something I don't get. Recently, they decided to build a new high-rise near our house. The location is great, and from what I signed the brochure, the amenities and space are impressive. When I looked into it, I found out it's owned by your company. What's the deal with that? I thought your company was in financial trouble. How could they afford to build such an amazing building? Oh, that matter. My company started a new business two years ago, and it's been doing really well. There's no financial crisis. In fact, it has grown into a company with annual revenues of $30 million. So, buying that building was easy. What? That can't be right. I thought your company in the U.S. was gone. And wasn't your salary reduced? The company in the U.S. hasn't disappeared. It's just smaller now. It still exists. We're expanding our business internationally because the potential revenue outside of the U.S. is much greater. The reduction in my salary was only temporary during this transition period. Our company has an incentive system. My father made sure to adjust so that other employees wouldn't face a salary cut. But since I'm family, I told them it was okay to reduce my salary temporarily. My base salary was sufficient to begin with. And besides, I already had a significant new role lined up for me. Why didn't you explain such important things to me? I tried to explain, but you never gave me the chance. Besides, it's common knowledge that my father's company is rapidly growing. You would have easily found out if you had done a bit of research. You just assumed the worst, didn't you? Well, that's true, but... I mentioned I had a big job lined up, and that's because I'm going to be the president of my father's company. President, you. My ex-husband was so shocked that he suddenly raised his voice. His voice was so loud that I had to pull the phone away from my ear and furrowed my brow in annoyance. Thinking to myself, so noisy. Yes, I just need to live in the UK for a while to be the president. It's more convenient to work there. I delayed making a decision because you and Lily were still around. I thought I would discuss it with both of you, 
once Lily's celebration party was over and things had settled down. My ex-husband seemed at a loss for words, and no response came from him. He fell silent, probably stunned. Hello, are you listening? By the way, after you guys abandoned me, I gladly accepted the offer to become the president. I've already set the date for moving to the UK, and soon, I'll be the president of a company with annual revenues of $30 million. That's ridiculous. Unbelievable. Even during the property division, it was only $100,000. It's a large amount, but nowhere near $30 million. Such wealthy people are not common. Indeed, that would be the norm. Companies with annual revenues exceeding $30 million are rare. However, the situation changes on a global scale. It is said that the salary gap between presidents of companies that operate internationally and those that don't can be tens of times different. Our company has not been limited to the U.S. for a long time. It has been able to grow so much because we have expanded our business internationally. All my savings were managed under my father's name because you and Lily were so reckless with money. So, I decided to entrust most of my salary to my dad, who I knew could successfully manage and invest it. But I saw a pay slip with a salary of $6 per hour. What was that about? Oh, I remember you mentioned that. I thought about it afterward, wondering what you were referring to. I realized it was probably the payslip of a part-time cleaner working for us, and that's from years ago. The company has been concerned that the wages for part-time employees might be too low, so I was conducting a review. I was looking back at all the past wages. The payslip you saw is probably from years ago. Now, the minimum wage everywhere is over $9, so it's clear that $6 an hour just isn't possible anymore, if you think about it. I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity. If he had looked closely at the payslip, he would have noticed the different name and date. He must have been desperately searching for something to use against me. Maybe that's the payslip he happened to see. But seriously, even a fool would notice that. So, I've been mistaken all this time. I let a woman worth 30 million slip through my fingers. Well, it looks that way. I'm hanging up now, and say hi to Lily for me. With that, I abruptly ended the call from my ex-husband. After that, I received numerous messages and relentless calls from my ex-husband, begging me to reconsider, but I ignored them all. Still, he was so persistent that I blocked him on everything yesterday. Three months have passed since then. I am living in the UK now. Work has been extremely busy without a break but I am grateful for the increased workload. With no personal troubles, I can engage in my work stress-free, so no matter how busy, it doesn't feel like a burden. Lily has called me several times since then. I'm really sorry, Mom. When I entered middle school, Dad started bad-mouthing you, saying you were cheating or mocking me. I believed all that and blamed you for everything. I'm sorry for all the awful things I've said over the years. Lily seemed genuinely remorseful, and I considered forgiving her, but her past behavior towards me, influenced by her father's words, was too harsh to simply overlook. 
I'd like to say it's understandable because it was what your father said, but you also had a part in this. Even though I'm apologizing like this, you won't forgive me. You are my mother, also you are wealthy, right? Please, I can't lower my standard of living now that I'm used to having you around. Help me out. I'll go anywhere, even to the UK. Lily's argument was that life was comfortable and somewhat affluent when I was around, without any inconvenience. But since I left, they were evicted from the apartment, and now she and her father are living in a small, cheap rental, struggling with their new life. However, her words, you are my mother, echoed painfully in my ears, a reminder of the accusations I had faced before. It dawned on me that her apology might be momentary, not truly believing she was in the wrong. I couldn't side with Lily any longer. If her apology had been sincere, I would have forgiven her without hesitation. That's what parents do. They end up wanting to indulge their children. But our situation was different. Lily had ridiculed me for so long, it seemed impossible for her to be genuine and reconnect with me now. She had always been a child with high pride. Therefore, I decided it was time to stop being her mother. You said, you're my mother, but you also told me not to act like a mother to you. So, I stopped doing that. I stopped acting like your mother. Sorry, but you are now a full-fledged adult. From now on, you need to live your life on your own. Good luck. Wait, what? Are you abandoning your daughter? Without your help, I can't go to college and my first paycheck will all go to rent. You abandoned me first, remember? Besides, I gave your father $100,000. You shouldn't have to live so tightly, at least for now, right? That money, dad bought a car and I bought a designer bag. So there's hardly any left. Lily said that, looking a bit awkward. It seemed that both my ex-husband and daughter, having lived comfortably on my salary, couldn't stop their lavish spending suddenly. But that's not my concern anymore. I don't care about that. I've made up my mind. You need to figure it out yourself. Goodbye. With that, I ended the call. However, I didn't intend to block my daughter. She is someone I've spent over a decade with, after all. If she ever genuinely finds herself in trouble and sincerely apologizes, putting aside her pride, then perhaps I'll be there to help. But that seems like a distant possibility. Life in the UK is busy and not easy. But I am happy now. Someday, I might plan a recreational trip to the US with my employees who live in the UK. Thinking about such things, I spend another peaceful day alone. Don't come to my daughter's wedding, you monster. You don't want to ruin Lisa's wedding. And you don't need to know when it's happening. George got carried away and said such a thing. It was like when he didn't tell me about this cool open day. How long will he keep repeating the same thing? It trembled with anger. Got it. But I replied briefly, knowing it's pointless to argue with a drunk. And in my mind, I whispered, you'll regret this. George hasn't realized that things are not the same as before. Still in a good mood, he fell asleep snoring. My name is Mae Richards. I'm a 55-year-old housewife. 
Currently, I work part-time at a local factory, living with my husband, George. We have one daughter. Her name is Lisa. She's living on her own while working as a professional after graduating from college. I'm really happy that she has grown up to be such a considerate and good girl, often checking in on us. As a parent, it makes me incredibly happy, but as a woman, I have a certain complex. It's the large burn scar on my face. Sometime after I got married, I encountered an accident scene. While waiting at the crosswalk, a car collided right in front of people on the opposite side. Gasoline started leaking from the car, and it seemed about to ignite any moment. The area turned chaotic. Then, I found myself instinctively running towards the scene. Are you okay? Recklessly, I dove into the accident site and helped someone who couldn't move. But then, I saw flickering orange flames before me. I honestly thought it was over, that I had to escape too. But the cries of a girl trapped under a bicycle brought me back to my senses. I couldn't give up just like that. I grabbed the crying child's hand, rescued her, and handed her to another pedestrian before running back to the scene. Then, I carried an old man who had fallen and twisted his leg to safety. At that moment, there was a small explosion with a loud bang. Perhaps I was in the wrong place because I took the full brunt of the blast and fell down. When I came to, my face felt hot, and the old man yelled, You all right? I'm okay. Is anyone else hurt? Looks like everyone's evacuated. You need to get to the hospital. I felt relieved at the old man's words. Miraculously, everyone had finished evacuating. Even the driver had managed to escape. And despite the severity of the accident, there were no casualties. I went to the hospital. The blast of hot air I had faced caused a burn on my face. It wasn't serious, but a large scar remained on my exposed face. Even knowing what I did was right, the burn mark in such a visible place bothered me. According to the doctor, my skin was red and raw, and the mark would remain like a bruise, never fading. George encouraged me. Don't worry about scars on your face. Be glad you are alive. I felt happy to be married to George. Indeed, he was right. I couldn't wallow in self-pity forever. I returned to my part-time job after a while and resumed my normal life. Soon after, I discovered I was pregnant. I was delighted and immediately told George. George, we're having a baby. Really? I was sure George would be happy. However, after his initial surprise, George's expression fell. What's wrong? Well. Feeling a bit anxious, I asked him. I've been thinking, maybe it's too soon for a baby? What? We've only been married a little over a year, right? Maybe we should enjoy some more time as a couple. George's words hit me hard. Sure, couple time is important but our child's life is obviously more precious. George never said to have an abortion because he would be the bad guy. However, I was angry at his phrasing which led me to abortion. That was our first big fight. We didn't speak for a while and the house was eerily quiet. 
A few days later, while in the shower, I fought it over. I couldn't go on like this, but I also couldn't give up on our baby. So, I decided to approach George and make him understand. Resolved, I got out of the shower and headed to George's bedroom when I heard his voice. I don't know how to say this. I heard George's voice and stopped in my tracks. It seemed he was on the phone with his mother. They were talking about the baby. George continued the call, unaware that I was listening. A mother with a face like that. That would be sad for the child, wouldn't it? I was planning to divorce eventually. But having a kid now is a huge mistake. I froze when I heard those words. She got that way helping others. So I can't dismiss her. And honestly, I think it's admirable. But think about what it's like for me. Having to live with her, huh? Tears began flowing from my eyes without me realizing it. After all his kindness, to think he felt this way behind my back. If he wanted a divorce because of my scar, he should have done it back then. Quietly, I left the room. And then, I packed my things and left the house. But my parents' house is far away. With nowhere to go, I found myself in a park, wondering what to do next. Anyway, I'll head back to my parents' house in the morning. I'll need to spend the night somewhere since I've already showered and removed my makeup. Feeling embarrassed to go anywhere with my face like this was a new and shaming experience. Me. That's when I heard George's voice. He had noticed I left the house and came looking for me. Instinctively, I grabbed my bags and tried to flee, but he caught up quickly. What are you thinking, leaving the house at this hour? George yelled at me. Come on, we're going home. He gently took my hand. I pulled away. What do you mean? You're ashamed of me, aren't you? George looked shocked at my words. The kid would be better off not being born, right? If that's what you think, you should have just said so. Tears streaming down my face, I pleaded with him. Hearing this, George sighed in frustration. That's true. But did you really accept that? You always think only of yourself. Think about our child, or even me, for once. Our arguments continued without resolution. I thought that if I backed down, things might settle, but I just couldn't bring myself to give up on having a child. I even considered raising the child as a single parent. However, when I mentioned divorce, George would say things like, If we divorce, I'll take custody. How could you, with that face, take our child to kindergarten or school? Which completely shattered my confidence. In the end, my desire to free myself was outweighed by my wish to have and raise the child. Feeling apologetic for being a mother with such a face, yet relieved and moved by the beauty of my daughter's face, I successfully became a mother. My daughter, named Lisa, grew up healthy and happy. George quickly became completely smitten with her charming smile. Despite having tried to persuade me to give up on having baby, he would say things like, Meeting Lisa is the happiest moment of my life, which left me with mixed feelings of anger and joy. As a father, he was very involved with Lisa. However, his treatment of me worsened over time due to his excessive love for Lisa, and the difference in his behavior became more apparent. I will go to Lisa's kindergarten event. That's better, right? 
George attended all the kindergarten events and even did all the regular pickups and drop-offs. Eventually, he acted as though he was trying to keep me from going to the kindergarten, not even telling me about the open days. Yet when Lisa got sick and the kindergarten called, he would say, May, maybe you should show your face at the kindergarten once in a while. We owe them that, which was just exasperating. George seemed oblivious to his own mean-spirited behavior, making me doubt his character. Despite having such a father, Lisa grew up well. Lisa, I love mom. Whenever she opened her mouth, that's what she would say. George seemed displeased with Lisa's words, but he never said anything against her, and thanks to Lisa, our home was always filled with smiles. As Lisa grew, she started asking for me to come to the kindergarten. Mom, I want you to come to the next gymnastics open day. There's an open day. Yeah. I was praised for being good at forward rolls. Watch me. It seemed Lisa was doing some gymnastics, and she happily started doing forward rolls on the carpet. Watching her, George opened his mouth with a smile. That's true. Lisa is really good. It's great that mom could see this. Yeah. So, come and see me on the open day. No, too bad. Mom has to work the day. Dad will go instead. Lisa, show mom at home instead. That made me furious. I hadn't seen any notice about the open day. George probably heard from her teacher, we've put a notice in the handout and took it out himself. I didn't know the schedule for the open day or whether I had to work. If Lisa wanted me there, I could have taken the day off, but he told her right from the start that I couldn't come, which was just terrible. As expected, Lisa's face fell when she heard George's words. Seeing her sparkling smile turn sad, my heart ached. Don't make that face. Mom wants to come too, but it can't be helped. Let's make sure Mom can come next time. Okay. Lisa replied reluctantly to George's words. That night, after Lisa had gone to sleep, I spoke to George. I didn't know about the open day. I could have taken time off. This is awful. Don't be so mad. I thought if I told you, you'd want to go. But Lisa wants me there, doesn't she? I said this angrily to George. Tears began to well up. Lisa asked me to come for the first time. I desperately wanted to make that happen for her. Calm down. I hate to say this, but what will Lisa's friends think if they see your face? What if they get scared and Lisa gets bullied because of it? That's... You're saving other people's lives and ruining your own family. George spat out those words and left the living room, quitting his evening drink. Left alone, I broke down and cried. Regretting for the first time that I had been involved in that accident. The same pattern continued afterward. Even when Lisa was in elementary school, George attended the open day and I wasn't allowed to go. Only at the sports day, I was able to sneak in to see her because there were so many people that nobody could recognize me as Lisa's mother. That was the only school event I was ever involved in. As she became a teenager, even George was told not to come by her, and ultimately, I couldn't properly watch her enjoy her school life. I resigned myself to thinking it was my fault. Dad was always there, but Mom, you're just not interested in me, right? 
Lisa seemed to think so, gradually distancing herself from me. I felt as if I had lost my only emotional support, enduring painful days. Thankfully, Lisa continued to thrive, becoming a high school student, a college student, and then a working adult. Luckily, her rebellious phase ended in high school due to a certain event, and now we are as close as we used to be. And now, Lisa was about to get married. Her partner was a wonderful man named Sean Gray, five years her senior. Sean was the cousin of Lisa's best friend Mary, who she had known since high school and lived nearby, leading to their dating after several meetings. My boyfriend wants to come over to greet you. George responded to Lisa saying that, Of course. I have a duty to see what kind of man he is. Lisa and I just smiled wryly at his pompous attitude. Lisa also called out to me. Mom, you'll be there too, right? Of course. I'm looking forward to meeting Sean. Really? George interrupted our cheerful conversation. You shouldn't be there. What if it leads to a breakup? What do you mean? Why would it lead to a breakup? You know, with a mother who's scored like... What if he finds out? George was tough on me but timid when it came to Lisa. He still tried to keep me away from Lisa's boyfriend because he didn't want me out. I don't think that's the case. Lisa said to me in a hesitant voice, seeking reassurance. I wanted to meet Sean, but I thought if I insisted on my way now, it might upset George and cause problems during the marriage meeting. So I thought it best to stay silent and step back. I said to Lisa, All right, I'll step aside then. Mom. Lisa's face fell just like it used to but I smiled at her reassuringly, conveying that it would be okay. The meeting to introduce the families was a great success. George liked Sean, saying in his usual tactless way, I'm glad Lisa's fiancé isn't some ugly, senseless jerk. He was in a very good mood. It seems Sean's parents also came along and even shared a drink together. George was happy throughout the evening. Perfect parents. And they seem to like me, too. Now that Lisa is getting married, she won't be mistreated. It would be tough if she were the child of someone ugly and disgraceful. His comment included a sarcastic jab about it being good that they hadn't met me, which was quite unpleasant. It seems they even discussed the wedding plans. It was supposed to be just a greeting, but we managed a perfect meet-up and even talked about the wedding. Oh, when is it? Don't come to your daughter's wedding, you monster. You don't want to ruin Lisa's wedding, do you? You don't need to know when it is. George got carried away and said such a thing. It was like when he didn't tell me about this school open day. I trembled with anger, wondering how long he would keep repeating the same behavior. Got it. But I replied briefly, knowing it was useless to argue with a drunk. And in my heart, I muttered, you'll regret this. George hadn't realized that things were not the same as before. Still in a good mood, he soon fell asleep snoring. Then came the day of the wedding. George was nervously preparing from the morning, saying, I'll take pictures for you. Did he think I would be grateful for that? I just turned away, unimpressed. What's up? Don't soak. This is all for Lisa's happiness. 
If you step back, everyone will be happy. Just stay quietly at home today, okay? With that, George headed off to the wedding venue. I watched him leave silently, but the idea of just staying home quietly as George suggested didn't sit right with me, so I headed out to a particular place. As I was nearing my destination, my phone rang. It was George. Probably to brag, I fought, as I sighed and put away my phone. But then, the phone kept ringing incessantly. It was too annoying for me. Hello. I answered with frustration as the calls wouldn't stop. On the other end, George was panicking. I listened intently, wondering what was going on. Where are you? What are you doing right now? Why are you panicking? It's an important wedding day. Don't call me now. Wait. Don't hang up. Gay's a big problem at the wedding. George said frantically. His rush confused me, and I frowned, asking for clarification. What do you mean? Just come here quickly. I hung up the phone but started walking unhurriedly. Then I walked through the door of my destination. Hi, May. Mary, it's been a while. There was Lisa's best friend, Mary. The wedding has started. Mary greeted me with a smile. Yes, this was the venue where Sean and Lisa's wedding was taking place. Lisa had told me, no matter what George says, make sure you come. If I didn't show up, Lisa's friend Mary had even promised to come and fetch me. That's why, no matter what George said, I had decided to come today. If I showed up, George might be embarrassed, but I didn't care anymore. If anything was said, I was ready to snap back. That was my mindset. And as I arrived at the venue with Mary and peeked into the hall. But I was surprised when I looked inside. There was George, right now in the spotlight. What's happening? When I asked, she pointed at Lisa with a smile. Lisa spoke through the microphone. Dad, explain to everyone why mom isn't here, in your own words. Well, uh... I was taken aback by her words. Mary, what's going on? What is this situation? I asked Mary again. Actually, Lisa has been planning this long before she even started dating Sean. Mary said, smiling reassuringly at my confusion. The story goes back several years. Lisa hid her rebellious teenage years in middle school. Added to that, her frustration exploded because I had never attended a single school event, creating a big rift between us. George just watched gleefully and did nothing to mend our relationship. I was troubled by my relationship with Lisa and lived in a state of depression. However, a turning point came. When Lisa became a high school student, she said, I want to bring a friend home. A friend, of course, your friends are welcome. They planned to study together from morning until evening. This was a first. However, while I was happy, I was also self-conscious about the scars on my face. But, maybe it's better if I'm not at home? When I hinted at this, Lisa nonchalantly said, it doesn't really matter. Encouraged by her words, I decided to go all out and prepare lunch and cake. Then the day arrived. Mary, this is my mom. 
The girl called Mary looked at my face and widened her eyes for a moment in surprise. I thought she was bothered by the scars, but I smiled kindly. Mary, right. I'm Lisa's mom, May. We have similar names, don't we? Yes, I'm Mary Murphy. Nice to meet you. Let's study. My room is this way. Lisa led a bewildered Mary to her room. Feeling I had made Lisa and Mary uncomfortable, I was disheartened. What if this caused a rift between Lisa and Mary? I wondered whether I should bring them tea or perhaps it would be better to leave the house. But just then Lisa, who had just gone into her room, yelled out. Mom! Wondering what was going on, I hurried to Lisa's room. There I found them, wiping away tears while laughing. What's going on? Why are you both crying? Then Lisa said, Mom, is it true that you got your facial scar from saving someone in an accident? What? I was taken aback by her sudden question. I had told Lisa that my burn was due to my own carelessness. Because George had said, don't say it was from helping someone. I agreed with him. I never thought it was anything special. I thought it wasn't something worth mentioning. But somehow, Lisa knows about it. While watching the serious faces of Mary and Lisa, I said, Yes, but why? It's true. Mary spoke before Lisa. My grandpa was the one you saved back then. Seriously. Mary continued. Her grandfather had the accident before Mary was born. Facing a burning car and unable to move because he had twisted his ankle, a young woman had come to his rescue. Later, when things calmed down, he wanted to return the favor but couldn't find her because the police wouldn't give out her personal information. All he knew was that she had gotten a facial burn at that time, and her name was May. The whole family thanked her for saving his life. My grandpa passed away last year, but he told me that story many times. I never imagined it was Lisa's mom. In our family, you're like a phantom hero. Mary said, wiping away tears. That's probably why she looked surprised and confused when she saw my name and scars. It was a miraculous meeting, and tears flowed from my eyes. I'm glad you became friends with Lisa. From then on, Lisa stopped keeping her distance from me. Mary frequently visited our home, and Lisa and I were also invited to Mary's home, where we all became close. Actually, I was already acquainted with Mary's cousin Sean and Sean's parents. I never expected Sean and Lisa to get married, but because of this connection, there was no reason for me to oppose their marriage. Later, Lisa realized that the reason I hadn't come to her kindergarten and school was because of George. Though he might have been a good father to her, she sensed from his words and actions that he was belittling me. Thinking she wouldn't be able to have me at her own wedding? With that in mind, Lisa hid a voice recorder in the living room. The recorder captured George mocking me, which infuriated Lisa. That's why she decided to play it during today's opening movie. George must have been in a frenzy when he saw it, which is why he called me in panic. And with the end of the phone call and the opening movie, I ended up in the spotlight. Well... George was shrinking in front of the accusatory stares of Lisa and the guests, sweating profusely. 
I always wanted mom to come. I'm shocked to find out dad has always been telling her not to. Lisa, I needed thinking of you. For me, whoever asked you to do that? Lisa exploded in anger, yelling at George. Lisa, calm down, okay? Today is your wedding day. June and all of Sean's relatives are here, too. George said, forcing a smile. At that moment, Sean's father stood up. Is what Lisa saying true? We were told May couldn't join because she was sick. It's true. She had a cold. And even today, she's got a stomach ache. She always falls ill at crucial times. Just then. May, let's go. Mary grabbed my hand and led me into the venue. Though I was pulled in, I walked proudly behind her. Mom? Lisa saw me and smiled happily. Why are you? George's voice carried over the microphone. With all eyes on me, George fumbled again through the microphone. My wife's facial burns were due to carelessness. She looks like a monster. But Sean and Sean's relatives don't be scared. George was laughing, but I did not hide my face. For Lisa, who had gone to such lengths for me, I decided not to be ashamed of my scars anymore. Even as everyone in front of me was exposed to his cold stares, George still treated me like a monster. Sean's parents and all the relatives were trembling with anger. If I may use Mary's words, I was their phantom hero. It felt proud to have people stand up for me and be angry on my behalf. Just fix this situation. Just one word from you clearing my innocence would settle this. Say that I never told you not to come. George turned away from the microphone and came over to whisper in my ear. How absurd. How can I clear suspicions when I'm not innocent? I took the microphone. I apologize for the disturbance. I said, bowing deeply. Just as Lisa said earlier, I could never attend Lisa's kindergarten or school events because my husband wouldn't allow me. Hey, you fool. George turned pale at my words. If being worried that Lisa might get bullied because of my facial scars meant I couldn't say anything. Mom. But Lisa was meeting Mary and Sean changed my life for the better. George looked at Sean as she said this. Sean nodded with a smile. The scars I have were acquired long ago at the scene of an accident while helping others. The scars were significant, and there were days I regretted being involved in that accident. However, discovering that the person I helped was Lisa's best friend Mary, and Sean's grandfather reassured me that my actions were not mistaken. George looked stunned by my words. My husband has said harsh things to me, like I did something foolish or wasted my life by saving someone else. But I realize now more than ever that I wasn't wrong, and I am endlessly grateful to Lisa, Sean, Mary, and their families for accepting me with my scars. Please continue to look after Lisa. I bow deeply again. The applause erupted from the venue. I apologized once more for involving everyone in this, and as I stepped away from the spotlight, the host smoothly transitioned us back into the wedding. May, please don't leave. Sean's father urged me to stay. Thanks to him, I was able to witness one of Lisa's most important moments for the first time. The heartless monster should leave. Lisa. 
I can no longer see you as my father. Lisa kicked George out of the wedding. George, devastated by the words from his only beloved daughter, sat on a bench outside the venue, weeping bitterly. I approached George. Do you now understand how it feels to be told not to attend your daughter's important events? I thought it would lead to some reflection, but George's response was far from what I expected. It's a wedding. Don't equate it with past the open days. It was a complete misdirect of his anger. Hearing this, I was appalled by George's lack of remorse. Who told you not to come to the wedding? And remember, school events were important only once. George was silenced by my stern tone. Perhaps I should regret having obeyed George's words all this time. This wedding, which made me realize this, is something I will never forget. I returned to the venue alone and watched until the end. It was a beautiful ceremony. Tears streamed down my face as Lisa, from her bridal seat, frequently smiled at me, ensuring I was there. It was as if she was a little child again, checking if her mother was present. I'm so happy you are here. She told me at the end of the ceremony, and I cried again. I must have made her feel lonely so many times. Though regrets surged, I resolved not to dwell on the past. From now on, I will be there for all of Lisa's important moments. I promised that. After the ceremony, George's parents and relatives who were previously unaware of his misdeeds, came to me to apologize. My parents were furious. Especially my father, who said, you can come back home anytime if you decide to divorce. It feels odd to rely on my parents at this age, but their kindness was overwhelming. Perhaps if I had consulted them sooner, my future could have been different, but I believe this is the best and happiest present I could have created for myself. The story didn't end there. One of Sean's friends who attended the wedding worked at the same company as George, and news of the incident spread quickly through George's company. George, who pretended to be a family-oriented man but treated his wife monstrously, is now being bad-mouthed as a monster man. He seems to have no place in the office and now has lunch alone. Sean's friend reported this to me through Sean. I wish he could understand a little of what it feels like to have no one to talk to. I replied with that remark and it seems no one else wants to speak with George now. I thought to myself, serves him right. I then prepared myself and told George I wanted a divorce. Divorce? Isn't that a bit drastic? You were planning to divorce me when I got burned, weren't you? I'm just saying what you wanted. That's... George refused to accept the divorce. He was probably a little scared, being alone at work, shunned by relatives and his daughter, and now me leaving as well. But I was determined not to be swayed by George any longer. The only thing you can do for me now is to let me be happy by divorcing? Having such a father might even mean Lisa gets mistreated cut ties with both me and Lisa. George slumped his shoulders at my words. Then I'll stay away from Lisa, so please reconsider the divorce. He pleaded with teary eyes, but I was firm in my decision. Lisa has asked me to live with her. I'll be moving out tomorrow. I left him clinging and slapped the filled-out divorce papers in front of him. 
George truly ended up alone. Now, even the neighbors keep their distance from him. Lisa told me she saw him buying a ready-made dinner at the supermarket, looking dejected after work. He let you handle all the hardships and just enjoyed the good parts. Now it's his turn to struggle a bit. Indeed, George can't clean, do laundry, or cook. The sin of not cherishing his wife was greater than he imagined. I am now living happily with my daughter and her husband. Lisa is pregnant and will become a mother next fall. My goal is to be a mother like you. Lisa said lovingly as she caressed her belly. When my baby is born, let's go to the kindergartens all events together. What a wonderful invitation that was. I may be getting older and my tear ducts looser, but I nodded again, holding back tears. I can't get back the past, but I'm sure the future holds happiness. I've truly felt that. You are in the way, go to an orphanage. I don't have a mom, you know. My name is Emily Johnson. I'm in fifth grade, living with my dad and mom, just the three of us. My dad is super kind, always taking me out on his days off. My mom is normal when dad's around, but when he's not, she comes off as cold or indifferent, making it hard to talk to her sometimes. I'm off. See ya. My dad leaves for work early in the morning, just like any other day. I said goodbye as I ate my breakfast. Looking at the clock, it's almost time for me to head to school too. I ate my breakfast a little quickly because I had to change clothes soon otherwise I would be late. Thanks for the meal. After finishing, I put my dishes in the sink and head back to my room to get dressed. Wait a minute. Mom calls out, stopping me in my tracks, pointing at the sink. Who's going to wash these? Uh, her luck is cold, almost angry. Normally, I just get dressed and go to school, but I felt like that would make her mad this time. Okay, I'll wash them. I mutter, and suddenly she yells, What? Speak up, I can't hear you. I freeze, feeling scared. But I knew I was in the wrong, so I apologized. Sorry, I'll wash them. Of course, as you should. From now on, take care of your own stuff. Mom angrily threw her apron on the couch and went to her room. Realizing I should care for my own things, I washed the breakfast dishes and left for school. Talking with friends at school, the topic of parents came up. Listening to their stories, everyone's mom seems kind, and even though they get scolded, they seem to get along well. What about your mom, Emily? Suddenly asked by a friend, I struggle to answer. But I've always thought my mom's coldness was a misunderstanding on my part. Probably because I hadn't been taking care of my things, making her moody. I replied that she is very kind. My friend said, that's nice, but I felt conflicted. I'm home. I came home from school, and my mom was not there. Maybe she went shopping, I think and started my homework in my room. Before I know it, it's dark outside, and it's usually dinner time, but mom hasn't returned. Then, I heard noises from the entrance, followed by the sound of the fridge opening. Peeking into the kitchen from my room's door, I saw mom. Feeling hungry, I went to the kitchen, and greeted her with welcome back. I'm back. Her reply is quick, without turning around, still seemingly in a bad mood. What's for dinner today? I laughed and asked her it. My mom's face was scary when she looked back, 
Probably because I asked her a question. What? I told you to take care of your own stuff. Uh. Dad will be home soon, and I'm busy cooking dinner. Unable to say anything more to my mom, I was about to make some instant noodles when Dad came home. I'm home. Hearing Dad's voice, Mom quickly took the instant noodles from my hands. I was confused about what to do, and Dad entered the kitchen. Oh. Are we just starting dinner? Seeing my kind Dad's face, I felt like crying. Welcome back. Today I got late going shopping, so I'm just making dinner now. Please wait a little longer, both you, Dad, and Emily. Mom's face softened. I wasn't sure if she was still mad, but the thought of eating dinner made by her made me happy. Later, we had dinner as a family and enjoyed playing games with Dad. I guess Mom was just in a bad mood. I fell asleep thinking that if I took care of my things properly, there wouldn't be any more reasons for her to get angry. From the next day, I tried to take care of my own things. I washed the breakfast dishes, folded the laundry, and put it away in the closet. I vacuumed my room and made instant noodles for myself when mom came home late. Thinking mom would be proud of me made me smile. Though she hasn't praised me yet, she has been getting angry less often. When dad was home, we enjoyed our time together as a family of three. I was happy about that. One night, I heard a groaning sound and woke up to find it was the middle of the night. Thinking it might be a ghost, I hid under my covers. The groaning continued for a while, and as I was shaking with fear, I heard the sound of an ambulance. The sound of the ambulance stopped just a few blocks away telling me that it had arrived nearby. Our front door step became noisy. I realized for the first time that it had stopped in front of my house, and I jumped out of bed to see my dad about to be carried out of the house. Dad. I ran over and screamed. Dad looked pale and sweaty, clearly in pain. Tears started flowing as I clung to the paramedic, begging, Please save my dad. The paramedic gently reassured me that they were taking him to the hospital now. Afterward, mom and I rode in the ambulance to the hospital, where dad was rushed inside. Mom and I could only wait in the designated area. My heart was filled with anxiety as I waited, wondering what would happen to my dad if something happened to him. However, Mom seemed unbothered, busy with her phone, not looking worried at all. I cried alone, waiting for someone to tell me everything would be alright. After what felt like an eternity, a doctor came to talk to us. Mom and the doctor had a serious conversation, and all I could understand was that Dad had been diagnosed with an illness and would need to stay in the hospital for a while. I was shocked at the thought of dad having to fight an illness. And my dad wouldn't be able to come home for a while. Once mom and I went back home. And after packing things for dad's hospital stay, she went back to the hospital. Left alone at home, I couldn't sleep, lying in bed until it was nearly dawn. School. I needed to go to school but I wasn't in the mood to go. I didn't feel like eating at all and just crawled back into my bed. Aren't you going to school? It was noon when mom noticed. She didn't scold me for not going to school, but seemed busy and left the house quickly, probably heading to the hospital. Having not eaten anything since the morning, I decided to go to the kitchen. There was bread, so I made a sandwich with ham and cheese from the fridge and ate it. In the evening, mom came back. She had bought some takeout for me. Eat this today, 
And I also bought some instant noodles for you to eat from tomorrow. Okay, thanks. I thought I shouldn't bother mom since she's busy with dad's situation. So I just followed what she said. The next morning, I ate instant noodles for breakfast and went to school. My friends asked why I was absent yesterday, and I lied, saying I felt sick. The teacher seemed to know the situation and spoke kindly to me. When I got home, mom wasn't there, probably at the hospital with dad. I wanted to see dad too. I thought about asking mom if she could take me with her on her next visit. While I was doing my homework, the phone rang. I was the only one home, so I answered it. Hello. Oh Emily, what are you doing? It was dad on the phone, and hearing his voice made me tear up. Dad, are you okay? I want to see you. My dad laughed softly when he heard my cries. Sorry for worrying you. I'm okay now. I'd love to see you too. It'd be nice if you and mom could come visit. Yeah, yeah, I'll ask mom. Okay. Anyway, is mom there? I was puzzled by dad's question. Mom wasn't home. I had assumed she was at the hospital. Mom's not here, isn't she at the hospital? Hearing that, Dad seemed to realize something and spoke evasively. All right, she just left. She should be back soon. Emily, are you managing to eat? Yeah, Mom bought some instant noodles and stuff. After I said that, Dad went silent for a moment then changed the subject. After talking to dad for a while, I heard the front door open, so I told him mom had just come home. He asked me to hand the phone to mom. My mom looked a little upset and took over the phone to talk to my dad. When mom came back, I could smell cigarette smoke on her, wondering where she had been before heading back to my room. The next day, mom asked if I wanted to go to the hospital with her. I said yes, although she seemed a bit hesitant, but she took me. Seeing dad after a long time. He was connected to an Ford Rip, but smiled as soon as he saw me. Emily, you came to see me. I hugged dad. Seeing him looking well made me almost cry, but I was so happy to see him. After talking with dad for a while, Mom said it was time to leave, and reluctantly, I left the hospital room. Turning back, Dad was smiling and waving at me, telling me to come again. But little did I know that would be our last conversation. Dad's condition suddenly worsened, and he passed away quickly. I couldn't believe that my dad was gone, so I did as my mom asked, and put on my black clothes and went to the funeral site. Many people came to my dad's funeral to say their goodbyes. Seeing mom handle everything so calmly made me wonder if dad was really gone. While I was spacing out at the edge of the venue, someone spoke to me. Hey, aren't you Emily? I turned around to find a woman who looked a bit like him standing behind me. Um, well... I was confused about who she was when she sat down next to me. It's been so long, huh? I'm your aunt, your dad's younger sister. Now that she mentioned it, she did resemble my dad. I didn't remember having an aunt, but I recall dad talking about his sister. My aunt. Yes, your aunt? I look like your dad, right? She smiled looking just like dad and then she suddenly hugged me it's okay to cry you've been strong emily i hadn't realized i was crying until she spoke and her words made me cry even more it felt like the first time i truly understood that i wouldn't see dad again 
After my aunt comforted me, I thanked her and went to get a drink. When I entered the room, my mom was there, looked at my sobbing face, and said, What? Did you cry? What an embarrassing face. Mom's cold words hurt me. Aren't you sad, Mom? I couldn't help but ask, seeing that she didn't seem sad at all. There's no point in being sad. He's gone. I shivered at Mom's cold response. I thought we had fun and laughed together as a family of three, but I wondered if Mom disliked Dad. While I was frozen, my aunt came over. Oh my, my sister-in-law, it's been a while. My aunt greeted her with a smile, and mom's expression changed. Oh, it has been a while. Need any help? No, there's nothing. Um, well, Emily, let's go over there with me. My aunt took my hand and led me out of the room. It was clear from mom's face that she wasn't fond of my aunt. I stayed with my aunt until the funeral was over. Emily, it's time to go home. A while after the funeral ended, mom came to pick me up. My aunt had been holding my hand but let go so I could leave. She looked a bit sad. Emily, see you again. Yeah, see you. As I reluctantly left with mom, an unfamiliar car stopped. Sorry to keep you waiting. It seemed to be someone mom knew, as she opened the car door. A man I didn't recognize was driving, and I instinctively hesitated to get in. Don't dawdle, get in. Mom's tone, unlike any I'd heard before, made me reluctantly get into the car. The car drove in the opposite direction of our house, and I watched the parsing scenery outside. I was feeling a bit scared of not knowing where we were going. We're here. Hurry up and get out of the car. I was dropped off in front of a large building, surrounded by an area completely unfamiliar to me. Mom, where is this? As I asked, Mom lit a cigarette and said, you are in the way, go to an orphanage. What did you say? Before I could understand what was happening, Mom and the unfamiliar man drove away, leaving me behind. I tried to chase after the car but quickly realized I couldn't catch up, and I gave up when I fell. Not knowing where to go, I headed back to where I was left, and a car stopped beside me. The window rolled down, and it was my aunt in the driver's seat. I never thought it would come to this. Emily, get in. Feeling relieved to see my aunt, I hurried into the car. She potted my head, and I started to cry quietly. How many times are you going to cry today, poor girl? We drove to a house. That seemed to be my aunt's. When I entered the house, I heard a man's voice saying welcome home. I instinctively hid behind my aunt, who laughed and assured me it was okay. Peeking out, I saw a young man standing there, smiling at me. I am sorry, scared you, huh? I'm her husband, so I guess I'm your uncle. He offered his hand for a handshake. His kind face reassured me and I shook his hand and smiled back. You must be hungry, right? Dinner's ready. You won't grow if you don't eat up. Stop it. What are you, her mom? Listening to their cheerful banter, I couldn't help but laugh. Then my stomach rumbled, and the two of them laughed at me when I was embarrassed and shy. For the first time in a while, I enjoyed my dinner. After dinner, they let me take a shower, and even prepared pajamas for me. Then, invited into the living room, I found they had prepared hot milk for me. Hot milk, really? You're not too old for that, are you, Emily? Hey, 
elementary school kids love hot milk, right or not? Their conversation felt so comfortable and made me laugh, and they joined in. They laughed along with me. Then she asked me to sit down to talk, and when I sit down in front of the hot milk, my aunt begins to talk. Hey, Emily, how about you being adopted by us? I was about to drink my milk when I choked on those words. Cough, cough, what? Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. I guess that was a bit sudden. My uncle potted my back. Well, my aunt laughed. You become our kid. You don't want to go back to that kind of mom, do you? I pondered my aunt's words. I didn't hate my mom. But thinking about everything at home, dad, and being left behind, honestly, I was scared to go back to mom. Actually, your dad had talked to us. What? I was surprised they mentioned my dad. Then my aunt explained in detail. The man with mom was her fair partner, and dad had known about mom's infidelity. He was really worried about me. When dad's illness was discovered, and it seemed he might not have long left, he asked my aunt and uncle to take care of me after he was gone. Hearing this, I couldn't stop crying, wishing more than anything to see my dad again. Your dad cared about you so much. He loved you dearly. My aunt said, comforting me with a warm hand. I silently thanked my dad in my heart. My beloved dad. The dad you always played with me. I decided I wanted to be strong, for my dad's sake. I want to stay with you, and and uncle. I said so, and they were both so happy to hear it. I need various procedures to stay with them officially, and it might take a while, but they assured me it's okay to stay with them in the meantime. I decided to do my best to help out around the house for my aunt and uncle. I helped with breakfast and dinner, and even with cleaning the bathroom and toilet, which made them worry about me overworking. Act like a kid and play, they'd say, so I decided to do my homework for the time being. Emily, did you always do housework at home? My aunt asked me about it during dinner. When I nodded, my uncle hugged me. It's tough for a kid your age to have gone through so much. Well, helping out is one thing, but I'm concerned you might be pushing yourself too hard. Indeed, I had been trying too hard to be praised by my mom, maybe even overdoing it without realizing it. I realized I wasn't even aware of it, and fell silent. All that effort never praised by mom. It made me think that perhaps all of it meant nothing to her. You don't have to worry about anything here. Sure, we'll accept your help. But what you should really be focusing on is your friends, school, and yourself. Take good care of yourself. My aunt's words deeply resonated with me. My uncle, teary-eyed, nodded in agreement. I felt incredibly happy to be with my aunt and uncle. Two weeks after dad's funeral, I was called to the teacher's office at school. I wondered what it was, and they told me that my mom was calling me. The teachers probably didn't know the full situation. Thinking the teachers would be troubled if I didn't respond, I answered the phone with trembling hands. Hello. Emily. Answer the phone quicker. Hearing my mom's voice, as harsh as ever, after so long made me freeze. Where are you? You're not at the orphanage I left you at. Unable to speak, I stayed silent. Are you listening? Well, whatever. I'm coming to pick you up. Then I'll get my allowance. You see, I'm having money troubles right now. Her words made my feelings towards her instantly cool. To think I wanted love from someone like her, sought praise from her, 
and was betrayed by her for my dad. Now I have my aunt and uncle, a place where I am cherished, and my beloved dad watching over me. I can be strong. I don't have a mom, you know. Before I knew it, those words were out of my mouth. What? What are you talking about? You must be a wrong number. Goodbye then. Wait a minute. I hang up on her. The teacher beside me, surprised, asked if that wasn't my mom. I replied it was a stranger. The call was treated as suspicious, and a caution was issued throughout the school. I called my aunt by school's payphone, worried that my mom might come to pick me up at dismissal time. My aunt said she would come to pick me up immediately, and arrived shortly after. She also explained the situation to the school's teachers, who decided to contact Child Protective Services. After I went home, it turns out my mom showed up at the school, but the teachers handled it, and she left with a bitter look on her face. After that incident, my mom didn't storm into the school anymore, but just to be safe, my aunt or uncle would come to pick me up before dismissal time. I felt guilty for the inconvenience, but my aunt and uncle assured me not to worry about it, and always greeted me with smiles. Thanks to my aunt and uncle, I have been living happily. Even at school, the teachers look out for me, making me feel grateful for having so many allies around me. One day, a while later, the home phone rang. Lately, I've been answering calls at my aunt and uncle's house. So I picked up the phone as usual. Hello. The voice I heard was one I didn't want to hear. Well, if it isn't Emily, so you were there after all. I froze, recognizing my mom's voice immediately. I wondered how she found out I was here. Nobody was supposed to tell her. Stop staying there and come back. We're having a tough time here. My mom spoke one-sidedly to me, who was silent. My mom spoke unilaterally, coldly explaining that her fair partner's company had gone bankrupt, and they were out of money. Apparently, being with me would mean receiving government assistance, which they needed to survive. She mentioned they were living in a common-law marriage to get married, but now that they couldn't afford it, she was considering leaving him. The story was confusing to me, but I understood that she needed me for the money. She had said something similar when she called the school, so they must be really out of money. As I remained silent, my mom's frustration grew. Just as she started yelling, the phone was gently taken from me. I turned around in surprise to see my aunt, who gave me a reassuring smile. But in the next moment, her expression turned fierce, can't you even reply? Are you listening? Stop yelling. I can hear you without all the noise. Uh. My mom's voice faded away from the other end of the phone. My heart was racing. Aren't you ashamed using your daughter for money? Are you telling her to come back for that? Ridiculous. What do you think Emily is? Well, you have no right to interfere. Emily is my daughter. Give her back. And who left your daughter in front of the orphanage? Don't talk as if you have the moral high ground. I'll call the police. Say you kidnapped her. Go ahead, laughable. We have evidence of the terrible things you've done to Emily, and we'll gladly present that too. Actually, please do call them. It might speed up resolving this mess. What did you say? Hearing the argument between my aunt and mom made me feel like I was causing trouble. But then, my uncle, you had apparently returned at some point, patted my head from behind. It's all right. Leave it to us. This is a job for adults. 
He then pulled me to the kitchen and made me hot milk again. Emily loves hot milk, right? You drink quite a lot of it. Yes. I thought it was delicious the first time I tried it. That's why I like it. Hearing this, my uncle smiled happily. After a while, my aunt came back to the living room. Seeing me looking worried, she ruffled my hair. What's with that face? No worries. She's no match for me. As I fixed my hair, I thanked my aunt. Then, I helped with dinner preparation. Since coming to live with my aunt and uncle, I learned for the first time how enjoyable helping out can be. A few days later, I answered the phone again to find it was my mom. My aunt and uncle had said I didn't need to answer her calls anymore, but I wanted to help my aunt and uncle in any way I could. Is that you, Emily? Mom's really in trouble. I need your help. I've already told you, I don't have a mom. Oh, how heartless can you be? Wasn't it mom who raised you? Have you forgotten the fun days we spent together, just you, me, and dad? Hearing your mention dad made me both flinch and get irritated. The times I had with dad were indeed fun, but that kindness was only from dad. Mom, you dumped me. I was surprised by the loudness of my own voice as I spoke out. I felt a sense of relief as I expressed my feelings. I was standing up to my mom's words thereafter. You, you still my child. I didn't abandon you, I just left you temporarily. You said you were in the way, go to an orphanage laughing as you said it. Someone like that isn't my mom. Oh, that was, I was forced to say that. It's not my fault. Still, you abandoned me. So, I don't have a mom. If I were to say I have a mom, it would be my aunt. And my dad is my uncle and my dad who went to heaven. You're brainwashed. Just come back without making a fuss. I was arguing with my mom while crying. But strangely, I felt lighter, as if I had been holding back a lot all this time. Then at least let me live in the house you're staying at. I can't even eat without you. No way. Don't bother the people I love. I felt someone's presence and turned around to see my aunt and uncle standing there. My aunt potted my head and praised me for speaking up. My uncle nodded in agreement, tears in his eyes. Then my aunt took over the phone call, looking surprisingly pleased. According to my uncle, my words had made her very happy. My uncle thanked me for calling him dad. It made me wonder if it was okay to have said that, but their happiness made me happy, too. After that, there were no more calls from my mom. I thanked my aunt and uncle. Once I got used to living with my aunt and uncle, my aunt bought me a cell phone. I was thrilled to have my own phone for the first time, exchanging contacts with friends and enjoying life more than ever. One day, the rare sound of the home phone ringing caught us by surprise. Since the incident with my mom, the school had started contacting my aunt or uncle's mobile phones, and I had my own smartphone for calls from friends. I answered the phone, wondering who it could be. Hello. In contrast to my high spirits, the caller sounded very down. Hello, it's me. At first, I didn't recognize who it was, almost mistaking it for the wrong number. I was about to hang up, following the school's advice not to talk to strangers. It's your mom. Have you forgotten my voice? Uh, oh, I see. Realizing it was indeed my mom's voice. Her voice was so dull that I really didn't know who she was. You're in sixth grade now, right? Um, there's no one here right now. 
When I said that, my mom started to cry. I didn't hang up, wondering what I should do. Actually, I'm in the hospital. I got sick. Really? Hearing that my mom was hospitalized, I was reminded of my dad. Now, remembering him doesn't make me sad anymore. Instead, I feel energized by all the good memories he gave me. I have no one to take care of me. So, can you look after me? Plus, the hospital bills are piling up. I can't pay them. Could you ask your aunt for me? Say something, Emily. Why do I have to take care of someone else who is not my family? Uh. I also refuse to pay for your hospital bills. I won't tell my aunt and uncle. You don't get cocky. I'm still sick here. She has a lot of energy for being sick. My response to my mom being sick wasn't like when I heard about my dad's illness. My feelings towards my mom have truly cooled. No matter what she says, I no longer feel fear. But that doesn't mean I want to say anything mean to her. I just pity her. I hope never to become like her as I grow up. I was surprised by my own cold response. I got a cell phone. We hardly use the home phone anymore, and it might even be gone soon. So, this is really goodbye. My mom panicked at that. Don't say that, please. Then, give me your mobile number. I can't do that. There's really no one to take care of me. No one to support me financially. Well. I'll make sure to contact someone who might take care of you. My mom misunderstood my words and sounded a bit hopeful. I sighed at her hopeful tone, asked for the hospital's name, and hung up. I asked for the hospital's name and hung up. Then, I immediately contacted my aunt. After explaining what happened, my aunt was concerned but praised me for handling it well. And when I asked for a favor, my aunt agreed and immediately contacted someone. Someone likely to take care of my mom. A few days later, I noticed the home phone ringing persistently. Assuming it was probably my mom, I chose not to answer. The ringing continued into the night, even after my aunt and uncle came home. When I mentioned the constant ringing, my aunt sighed and answered the phone. As expected, it was my mom, and my aunt ended up in a battle with her. My mom kept demanding to talk to me, but my aunt refused it. I heard my mom panicking from the phone, saying she didn't expect her brother to come, questioning why you contacted her brother. The person I asked my aunt to contact was my mom's brother, I remembered my mom mentioning how much she disliked her own brother. My mom's brother was a very stubborn, righteous, and passionate person. Therefore, my mom's affair was outrageous to him. Furious upon hearing the story from my aunt, he had said he would come right away. Their reunion after several years turned out to be a disaster. It was directing my mom's anger towards us. My aunt was battling with my mom, but unusually my uncle told my aunt to take over for him. My uncle is very kind, so I wondered if he could handle my mom, but as soon as he took the phone, his expression turned serious. When he gets mad, he's scarier than me. My aunt whispered to me secretly. Hey, cut the crap. If you really want to talk that much, I'll come over. I'll make you apologize in front of Emily. Sick or not, I don't care. Be ready. My uncle yelled, and with a squeak, she hung up the phone. Ah, uh, she hung up. After the call ended, my uncle returned to his usual self, smiling as if nothing had happened. What they say about people who rarely get angry, being the scariest when they do, 
is true. Afterward, my mom was forcibly taken to her brother's house. It turns out her illness was something that could be cured quickly, and she was able to leave the hospital soon after. My mom, you had anticipated a luxurious life with her affair partner, was now helping with farm work at her brother's place, much to her dismay. She initially resisted the farm work, but ended up working begrudgingly after being scolded by her brother. Of course, she could no longer afford brand name shopping, and was wearing hand-me-downs from the villagers. As for me, the legal procedures were completed, and I officially became the child of my aunt and uncle. They threw a celebration party for me, and I laughed more than I ever thought possible. And to my delight, I found out that I would be getting a little brother or sister next year. I'm so happy and excited. Cherish my family. That's what I truly believe from the bottom of my heart. This is an upscale residential neighborhood. What are you doing here? We live in that high rise over there. This area isn't for people like you. I ran into my ex who cheated on me with a rich young woman and they both looked down on me again. You're still plain and poor looking. By the way, my salary is $100,000. Your salary is $100,000. That must be tough. The unexpected reply came from my husband. My name is Sarah Johnson. I'm 28 and work for a ceramics company. It all started when we visited a pottery market during a family trip in middle school. Now, it has turned into my job. While I'm happy to have turned my passion into my profession, I've thought being single might not be so bad. But life is unpredictable. You never know what kind of encounters you might have. I participated in a pottery market and ended up dating David, who I met there and works for an event company. Sarah likes her work and puts a lot of effort into it, so she respects my job too. I feel I can build a secure home with Sarah. He said that, and since I had no intention of quitting my job, I thought we could manage well even after getting married. David often travels to event locations for work and is busy on weekends. Likewise, I sometimes have to work on weekends due to the pottery studio schedule. It's unavoidable that we can't meet on days off or sometimes cancel plans at the last minute. As a good-natured person, I noticed something wrong with him too late. David was increasingly canceling our plans for work and not showing up for wedding meetings. He stopped answering my calls. One day, after my business meeting, as I was heading to the station, I saw David across the street. It was a coincidence. I could go straight home today and wanted to have dinner with him after a long time. Thinking this, I ran after him as soon as the traffic light turned green. David, are you done with work? Can we go together? Um. Next to David was a tall, beautiful woman with long legs, and they both turned around simultaneously. Moreover, the woman's arm was firmly entwined with David's. Hey, Sarah, what are you doing here? What a coincidence. I just finished my work meeting nearby. Are you still working? And who is this lady? It didn't seem like he was working, but I asked calmly. I knew his job involved interacting with many event hostesses and models. Well, this is Maria, a fashion model. Hello. She smiled at me warmly. She was stylish and cute, so she's a model, I thought. So it must be a professional relationship with David. I felt somewhat relieved. I didn't like seeing them arm in arm the whole time, but maybe that's normal for someone in her line of work. Hello, I am his fiancée, Sarah Johnson. I greeted her, and David made a face like he had swallowed a bitter bug, while Maria compared our faces and then burst into laughter. 
is this your fiancé? Ahaha, oh no, what a coincidence. Coincidence? I told you to hurry up. Now's the time, make it clear right here. Nodding to her upward glance, he looked at me. Well, Sarah, I'm dating Maria. Excuse me? I'm sorry, but cancel our engagement. I'm going to marry Maria. Wait, what are you saying, David? We met at a festival event and felt it was destiny right away. That's right. David really pursued me, saying he'd break up with his girlfriend. She spoke nonchalantly. So that's how it is. Thanks for everything until now. Wait, David. Let's talk this over properly. But there's nothing more to talk about. What do you mean by that? My mind is made up. Maria, as you can see, is cute, stylish, and just awesome. She's only 24, young, and comes from a wealthy family. It's just that my dad is the CEO. So, I'm going to marry Maria and become her family's son-in-law. Are you quitting your job? I thought you liked your current job. It's what Maria wants, and it pays better. Please cancel our wedding venue. Don't worry, I'll pay for the cancellation since it's my responsibility. David, you're amazing. I just want to be with Maria as soon as possible. Wow, you're so cool. I nearly collapsed but managed to hold myself up. It was clear, no matter what I said, it was useless. She was right. David was more crazy about her. I understand. I managed to squeeze out the words, I must not cry yet. I don't want to cry in front of these people. Well, see you around. Keep working hard, getting dirty with the clay. What's that supposed to mean? They walked away arm in arm, laughing. Two years had passed since I broke up with David and I turned 30, still dedicated to my work. Now, I have no regrets about that man. In fact, I consider myself lucky that I didn't end up with a cheating spouse after marriage. I felt energized when the pottery I designed came out of the kiln. There was someone who noticed me in this state. It was John, a craftsman at the pottery studio I've been working with for years. I thought his mind was filled with nothing but pottery. I was surprised when he invited me to dinner and confessed his feelings on the third occasion. I respected him as a craftsman and was honestly delighted. However, carrying a significant trauma, I was hesitant to step into a relationship again. So, I shared everything with him. I had announced my engagement at work and to the pottery community, so he knew about the broken engagement. He listened quietly and then gave me his usual gentle smile. That must have been tough. Yes, it was. Actually, I was shocked when I heard you were getting married. But I thought it was natural for someone as wonderful as you to have a partner. And I blamed myself for not making a move. Excuse me? It was an unexpected revelation. When you forced a smile saying your engagement was called off, I wanted to support you immediately, but I thought you needed time. I wanted you to keep making good pottery to help cheer you up. Have you been thinking about me for that long? And I might look it, but I'm quite popular. What? Maybe because my grandfather is wealthy. I've been approached by very beautiful women and have dated some, but I never felt thrilled by them. I enjoy working with Clay much more. Is that so? He spoke earnestly and straightforwardly, not bragging or joking. As I found this aspect of him intriguing, he looked at me intently. Sarah, you're the first person I've ever wanted to make happy. While feeling a chuckle rising, my heart warmed up. I thought to myself, I'll be fine with him, and naturally said, I'm happy. Thank you. A year later, John and I got married. Everyone at the company and the pottery studio congratulated us. 
To keep working, we initially lived in two places. One was near the pottery studio, close to his family home. I had heard his grandfather was wealthy, but I was amazed by the size of their mansion. We live in a part of it. We've discussed eventually leaving my job to work together at the studio and live there full time. The other place is an apartment near my company in downtown. The apartment still needs more furniture, so today we went to a nearby interior design shop. That's where the unexpected encounter happened. Not a pleasant one. As we were looking at sofas, a voice from behind said, Is it Sarah, the plain woman there? You're David. More than three years had passed, but I could not forget him. My ex fiance David stood there, with his wife, the model Maria. I knew they had married, as she had been flaunting it on social media and magazines. Yet, Maria seemed less charming than before, her expression harder, or maybe just different. I've also noticed she's been less visible in the media recently. David was smirking, but his face seemed to lack vitality. This is an upscale residential neighborhood. What are you doing here? Oh, do I need a permit to shop in an upscale area? You don't live around here, do you? This store is expensive, not for someone like you. Exactly. You still look plain and poor, just like your beloved Clay. I didn't expect an apology for the past, but I was tired of his condescending attitude. Right? If a tacky person like you comes here, it degrades the store. People might think we are poor too. Did you come all the way here? By the way, our home is in that famous high rise over there. And it's on the 25th floor. Their bragging annoyed me, but responding would be a waste of time. I remained silent. Not liking my attitude, David continued. You still love pottery, huh? You look as poo as ever. By the way, I make $100,000. He moved into that tower for me, working as my father's son-in-law. $100,000, that must be tough. What? The sudden speaker was John. I was so surprised that I echoed his sentiment. I'm a little worried about you. Hey, who is this guy? David noticed my husband and asked. Nice to meet you. I'm John Smith. It seems my wife, Sarah, used to know you. The couple looked shocked for a moment but then smirked at my husband. Well, you got married. Well, a perfect match for plain folks like you. He is such a spaced out person. Didn't even notice him here. What's with the that must be tough anyway? David glared at John. Because you live on the 25th floor of that tower, and your income is $100,000, right? That's right, my income is $100,000. David popped up. Seeing you all decked out in brand names, I can't help but worry, no offense. Are you mocking me? Just because you're poor doesn't mean you can make irrelevant remarks. Sadly for you, I'm not having any trouble. Is that so? Your wife doesn't look too well, though. Everything all right? Hey, Miria, what's wrong? Nothing. I'm okay. You wouldn't understand. A number like $100,000 is out of your lead. What about you, making $10 an hour? No, I'm not on an hourly wage. I'm not employed in the traditional sense. I stay at home. So, you're unemployed. Sarah got married only to be someone's cash cow. Wait, that's not right. Please don't insult my precious Sarah. A freeloader husband has to defend his wife, I guess. You're jobless and yet so weird. They continued to look down on us, misunderstanding the situation. Sarah, let's go. We shouldn't bother with these people who have no future. Yes, let's leave. John took my hand, and we walked away from there. Pathetic losers. 
Don't come around here anymore. Don't pretend to be locals. We live in the President Tower. As my husband responded, the two burst into laughter. Don't lie because you're so upset. Everyone knows the name because it's super famous. The highest around here. No way a jobless person could live there. Ignoring their loud laughter, we walked away. I can't believe we met them here. I'm so sorry, John. While walking, I apologized to him. Perhaps it was rude of me to worry about their finances upon our first meeting. This is why people say I can't read between the lines. Maybe. I almost burst out laughing at my always serious husband's comment. Clearly, they were the rude ones. But living so close in that tower is annoying. What if we keep running into them? Our apartment was nearby. Their tower was one of our options, but I was really glad we chose differently. John reassured me. Don't worry, they won't be there for long. Why? Isn't that woman's family wealthy? Do you know their name? I do, but... Confused by what he meant, I just stared. A few days later, as my husband and I were leaving the entrance, we heard a sudden voice. Seriously, you really live here? David and his wife appeared before us, and my eyes widened. Why are you here? Help us. What's the matter? I'm being kicked out of that tower. Oh, why is that? Because of unpaid rent. You haven't paid the rent? Well, that's understandable then. This really had nothing to do with us. Wait, they were patient with the payments until now, but suddenly they can't wait anymore, all because of your husband. Now Maria was the one shouting. How is that my husband's fault? When I heard the name Smith, I realized your husband owns our tower. She was visibly frustrated, her face turning red. It's not me, but my father. What? It was originally owned by my grandfather, but I think it's in my father's name now. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. The management company said if we don't pay up, they'll proceed with eviction. That's only natural. It's not a charity. What? That's why I said it must be tough on a $100,000 income. What do you mean? David exclaimed. With a $100,000 income for a couple, you could live quite comfortably under normal circumstances. But the rent for the 25th floor there is $5,000 a month. Surely you didn't forget to include taxes in your calculations. Taxes? Besides, you both love your brand goods. It's crazy not to be in financial trouble. Maria, you were the one who wanted to live there. When did the rent get behind? We have a social circle in that high rise. Luxury lunches, spa treatments, bags, jewelry. You need to have nice things or you won't be accepted. You could simply not associate with such people. I know it. Is keeping up appearances so important that you'd go into debt for it? Debt? David raised his voice. He was genuinely shocked. Didn't he notice anything? What do you mean we have unpaid rent and debts? That's the thing. It's tough being at the top among the high floors. As a model, I can afford to look shabby. There's hardly any modeling work for you now. Well, yes, but... So that was it. No wonder I hadn't seen her around lately. The industry seems tough, with new, young faces constantly coming in. As I murmured, Maria glared at me fiercely. Shut up, you plain woman. Damn it, Maria, you said you'd handle the finances, and you didn't even pay the rent. David confronted Maria angrily. Her family is wealthy, right? You always boasted about it. Why not ask them for help? I said with a hint of sarcasm. But her family's business has been struggling since last year, and they can't afford it. What are you? That's why you couldn't pay the rent, right? Maybe until now her family was helping out. 
Why do you know about my dad's company? Because my grandfather is the chairman of the Smith Group. Seriously? The Smith Group? So, you're a real rich man. David muttered in amazement. My father's company used to have dealings with yours, but not anymore. John continued calmly. My grandfather owns many apartments, both domestically and internationally. Then you should have said that when we met last time. One doesn't boast about such things, it's vulgar. What? Are you trying to get back at me? I didn't intend that, but it seems to have worked out that way. That's infuriating. Sorry about that. Don't apologize. It was almost like a comedy sketch. As I nearly laughed at their rapid exchange, Maria snapped. But that's not your money, right? You're just living off your grandfather's wealth. I set the record straight. John is a renowned potter. What? Some customers wait months for his ceramics. While creating high-demand items, he also produces affordable pieces at the pottery studio, and they sell out online. Really? My husband has never depended on his grandfather's money. Don't lump him with you. Though he has said he would help us if we ever needed it. John grinned, then turned serious again to address the couple. Normally, rent overdue for three months leads to contract termination and eviction, and if unpaid, forced eviction follows in another two to three months. That's also stated in your tower's contract, right? Maybe. They waited five months because they believed Maria's story. What do you mean? I heard that her husband is sick and has lost his income, so she was crying for the rent to wait. What, Maria? What the hell are you doing? But it was a lie, and there were debts from lavish spending. I've reported this to my father and grandfather. Why do you know about my debts? David was pale-faced, and Maria was nearly in tears. I looked into it myself. John said nonchalantly. I knew about the past from Sarah. We are happy now. And meeting them again was just a coincidence. So what's the problem then? But what did you say to Sari upon this reunion? No apology, just looking down and insulting her. I couldn't forgive that. But? I was genuinely worried about you. Living in that tower on a $100,000 income seemed concerning. Oh no. It's good that you found out before incurring more debt. John said this with a smile, leaving David and Maria speechless. What's with this air, acting all high and mighty? I admired his knack for speaking his mind. Yes, he's not being sarcastic. He's just speaking plainly. Is it because he's naturally a scion of a wealthy family, or is it just his personal character? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's more likely the latter. Hey Sarah, help me out, please, I'll apologize. Right? If you ask him, he'll surely help, won't he? Their sudden change of attitude was startling. Absolutely not. I also smiled sweetly, mimicking my husband. My smile was a bit mischievous. Your debt is none of my business. Exactly. Let's go, Sarah. Wait, don't go. Don't cut us off with a smile like that. Ignoring their cries, I walked away hand in hand with my husband. Eventually, David and Maria were evicted from the tower. Maria's father paid the overdue rent, but in return, she was disowned. Her family's business was in dire straits, and David's income had also decreased. Furious at her for wasting money just for show. Her parents demanded she repay the borrowed rent and the debt they covered before returning home. Disillusioned, David was considering divorce, partly blaming his own indulgence and financial negligence. Maria, it turned out, had secretly borrowed money from dubious sources, now pursued by shady debt collectors. Meanwhile, 
my husband and I were discussing the next designs for our new pottery series, well received in the market. Items for family use, for partners to share, and for personal relaxation time. We want to gradually expand our range to accompany each aspect of life. Sarah, what do you think about the color here? Please take a look. Sure. I dream that one day, our future children will also enjoy meals on the pottery my husband makes. Today, in our beloved studio, we are surrounded by the scent of clay, 